This joint session has been called to receive the annual State of the State address from His Excellency, His Excellency Jay Inslee, the 23rd Governor of the State of Washington. It is a privilege, pleasure, and honor to now introduce Governor Inslee. Uh, good afternoon and welcome Washingtonians to a critical year in the state of Washington uh, for our state. Uh, we know that every day of this legislative session is going to be an opportunity to make good on our commitments and to change the course of our future for the better. We have begun a short session with a long list of th things to get done. And I can encapsulate the state of our state very simply. We need action. We can wake up every morning in the next 60 days, understanding that we need action this day, which was Churchill's first order at the beginning of World War II. And I think it can serve to focus us on the task before us. I'd like to start today by thanking our frontline workers, our educators, our childcare providers, and our state employees for all they've done the last two years. I want to thank those who administer emergency services and plow the roads to keep Washington moving. Unprecedented weather events have demanded much of you already this year, including the National Guard, and we are all grateful. And a special thank you to the healthcare workers who have worked tirelessly for two years with little time for rest. You are heroes, and we are grateful for your service. I'm very happy to welcome our new members in the Senate, Yasmin Trudeau and John Lovick, and Brandy Donahue to the House. My thoughts are also with the family of former Supreme Court Chief Justice Mary Fairhurst, who we lost in December. And I know we'd all like to reiterate our condolences to the family of Senator Doug Erickson, who we lost after a struggle with COVID in December. He was one of the more than 10,000 Washingtonians lost to this virus, each of whom whose lives matter. And while we mourn our losses, let us also realize that because of our joint actions, we have saved thousands of lives. Now, we still need to contribute to the fight against COVID. And that's why attendance here today is limited and everyone is socially distanced. We are doing everything possible today to keep people safe statewide. We're increasing access to testing, to masking. We're helping educators find new ways of doing business. And the legislature has been a strong partner in this pandemic. Last session, um, they extended 26 emergency orders through the end of the pandemic and made laudable investments in our recovery efforts. This has been a long effort, but we are undaunted. And look at all we've done together. If you compare our success to other states, we've saved more than 17,000 Washington lives. These people are still with us because of what all Washingtonians have contributed to stay safe and healthy. And it's not an accident that our state continues to be named one of the best places anywhere to live, to work, to do business. Since I've had the honor of being governor, we've implemented one of the best paid family leave programs in the country. We've provided significant new funds to schools under McCleary. We've passed the best environmental justice legislation in the nation and passed the Fair Start for Kids Act to protect childcare options. We've successfully created more ways to connect people to careers beyond just college path. We've come back from multiple disasters, the Skagit Bridge collapse, the Oso landslide, historic wildfires, heat waves, drought, and now unprecedented flooding. So you as legislators have a lot to be proud of, but now we are going to be called upon to do more because we face a variety and a dimension of demands greater than ever as we enter 2022. We must take action this day to keep and strengthen our commitments to those in need right now and in the future. We must take action this day 
to fight the homelessness crisis, to reverse the social and economic disparities, to educate our children and serve those in foster care, to fund our transportation system, to protect our salmon and orca. And we must take action this day to fight the threat of climate change that is now hitting us so hard across our state. Over the last year, I've met people experiencing homelessness across our state, in Tacoma, Moses Lake, Walla Walla, Seattle, and Spokane. And we have seen what works to improve people's lives, a private place to live with a sense of dignity. That's why my supplemental budget includes an unprecedented $815 million investment in safe housing for those experiencing homelessness and to create more options for those struggling with housing availability. This budget also increases behavioral health services, continuing my administration's successful investments in these life-changing programs. All of us know that wraparound services are critical to helping people out of long-term homelessness. And it is fundamental that people not only get a roof over their heads, but get access to these necessary services. We simply have to provide rapid, supportive, supported housing as soon as possible this year. We also, I think, realize we need more opportunities for everyone when it comes to housing itself. We can't get more people housed if there is nowhere to build housing. So we must pass legislation that removes antiquated barriers to middle housing options in our cities, such as duplexes and townhomes, and provide more housing supply to make sure it's available to all income levels. Look, we just can't tell our constituents we're fighting homelessness and yet not provide ways to actually build more housing. So this means we need to allow housing that meets the realities of our tremendous population growth and economic growth this century. I think this is also a generational issue when you think about it. If our children and grandchildren are ever going to be able to afford rent or a mortgage, we simply need more affordable housing. My budget also reflects the need to take direct action to reduce poverty. I created a poverty reduction work group made up of people who had lived experiences in poverty so they could inform us. And using their recommendations, my budget would create a $125 million reinvestment fund to address economic and social disparities across decades that are the legacy of federal policies that have hurt communities of color. And our communities are suffering in other ways as well, like in our classrooms. We know students have lost opportunities during remote learning, despite the incredible efforts of our educators. Now to keep schools open, we have to invest more to deal with COVID and address learning opportunity loss. We are committed to having our schools open this year, but the impacts of necessary closures linger. And to help make sure educators and students have what they need, I propose reinvesting $900 million to help schools address students' critical needs. This proposal further empowers educators so that they can innovate to address what kids have suffered because of COVID, just as they have done throughout the pandemic. Educators, when empowers, can develop solutions to overcome opportunity gaps. We also propose increasing the number of school counselors, nurses, psychologists, and social workers available to serve K-12 students. Anyone who works with kids will tell you that these services are needed now more than ever. Young people in foster care and their families also have been uniquely impacted by the pandemic. So we offer $80 million to pay providers more for housing and support foster youth with complex needs to help young people transition out of foster care or juvenile justice to a successful future. Now, while we put the pieces together to address these current needs that confront our communities, we also have to take action this day to address the long-term existential threats to this state. 
In December, I spoke with astronaut Kayla Barron. She's a Richland High School graduate. I was in my home. Kayla was aboard the International Space Station. She's a long way from home right now. She's traveling 17,500 miles per hour above us. And she's orbiting the Earth once every 90 minutes. So I was pretty honored that she took my call. And I asked her what perspective this experience gave her about our collective home, this planet. And she said something that really has stuck with me. She told me she was amazed by how thin our atmosphere is, how at night there's a burnt orange glow at its edge, revealing just how paper thin the layer is between a livable world and the nothingness of space. She said, the most important thing we need to survive is the ability to breathe clean air. Our planet's fragile state is pretty clear from right here in the ground as well. Climate change is not merely a graph on a slide deck with an arrow pointed at calamity. It's found in the eyes of the people who saw floods go through their windows in Everson last month. And the evacuees who returned to see the charred ruins of their homes in Malden. Or the people in the Colville tribes who lost 600,000 acres of commercial timber to wildfires. And when I look into the eyes of people who have lost their home, and I see the pain they have, that's the pain of climate change. And we have to do everything we can to fight it. Every corner of our state faces climate-related disasters today, not tomorrow, right now. This is the fight for the future of our state, and we need to take action this day. So my budget, budget builds on the work we've done previously and put $626 million toward this noble effort. Legislators can be proud of the policies they've put to work here in our state already, and it's good to know we're not alone in this work. The world looks to our state as leaders in climate innovation. This was reaffirmed in November at the COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, where I led a coalition of 68 state and local governments to commit to drastically reduce emissions. Together, we're charting a path to fight climate change by cutting greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030 and to get to net zero by 2050. It is our state's legal obligation as well to reduce emissions, but it's also a practical and most importantly, a moral obligation. Legislators can be proud that their work have already created policies that will remove 43.5 million metric tons of pollution annually. But to meet our statutory commitment that we have made to the people of this state, we have to reduce emissions by 6 million more metric tons per year to reach our 2030 emission limits. That's the equivalent to the annual emissions of 1.3 million vehicles on the road. So through legislation, we can rev up this future and make new and existing buildings perform better. We can modernize regulations and incentivize industry to ensure clean energy projects are built here in Washington with living wage jobs and make electric vehicles more affordable by giving families thousands of dollars in rebates. You know, buildings are our state's second largest source of emissions, and many of them are energy inefficient, wasting resources and costing consumers thousands over the years. With buildings lasting anywhere from 50 to 100 years, we must act now to give Washingtonians more efficiencies and to decarbonize our homes, apartments, offices, retail spaces, and more. So to accomplish this, we have to require gas utilities to chart a path to decarbonize under the Climate Commitment Act. We can improve conditions for developers to grow clean energy resources here in our state. Look, there's a lot of good news in our state here. We see the future's promise already burgeoning in Washington at companies like Aviation in Arlington, where they're making the world's first all-electric commuter airplane. At Vicinity Mortar Corporation in Ferndale, where they're manufacturing, are going to be manufacturing electric buses. At the new solar farms popping up like dandelions in eastern Washington. And net zero buildings like the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle and the Catalyst Building in Spokane. 
We see clean energy projects built with strong labor standards, growing a broad range of union jobs and apprenticeship opportunities in their local communities, like at the Rattlesnake Flats Wind Farm in Adams County. Now, with all of the multiple challenges we face right now, why do I believe this legislature is up to the job of fighting carbon pollution this year? It's because this is the legislature that has in its hands the most beautiful place on the planet and the health of more than 7 million people in their hands. And I know you won't let the people down. And the same goes for salmon. As the future of salmon goes, so goes the future of our state. Our region's salmon are threatened by climate change, pollution and habitat loss. So we would invest $187 million towards salmon recovery. And we also need to restore the green corridors along rivers and streams known as riparian habitat, which keeps the water clean and cool. So our legislation sets a unique ecological blueprint for each river and stream habitat to conserve and restore these critical lands. This plan includes the Lorraine Loomis Act. It's named for the Swinomish leader in tribal salmon management who we lost in August. I'll tell you, Lorraine was such an inspiration to us young and old. She brought us together in favor of salmon. Our salmon cannot wait. They need action this day. And to realize this future, we must do it together with our partners. And fewer is critical in this effort as Washington State's tribal communities. So I'm introducing legislation that provides a stronger, clearer consultation process for projects that get funding through the Climate Commitment Act. We know we make progress when we work together. We also need to invest in our aging transportation system in a way that meets the demands of the future while aggressively decreasing the impacts of climate change from the same system. We need more transportation and less pollution at the same time. That's why my 2022 transportation budget is no ordinary supplemental proposal. We have a unique opportunity with one time and new federal funds along with state money to provide nearly $1 billion to fund transportation and clean transportation programs and activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector that preserve the inf infrastructure we have and it needs help and support critical investments to improve ferry service reliability. This includes $324 million to support ferry electrification. Look, we desperately need boats, cleaner boats, to give Washingtonians a reliable ferry service. Now, to legislators, if you have bigger ambitions or bolder ideas in transportation, and I'm encouraged that some of you do, I am really ready to engage and discuss and support your further efforts. My budget also imports increased diversity and inclusion in the transportation sector by addressing disparities in hiring and recruiting a diverse workforce at these entities. The broader transportation system remains our number one emitter of greenhouse gases that pollute our air and water and drive climate change. Last session, this legislature passed historic laws to reduce emissions, including the Climate Commitment Act. And we must not hesitate to take action this day to implement these laws. And we need a clean fuel standard as well. These laws have to go in effect in concert with our transportation budget. And I look forward to working with legislators to do this. We've proposed necessary and prudent investments this session, but we also have to invest in our financial stability. To assure financial stability, uh, our plan would build the reserve back to pre-pandemic levels in just four years from now. So my budget puts $2.5 billion toward our financial resilience this biennium. Putting this money in our rainy day fund and reserve funds will place our state on better footing for the next emergency. Now we just marked the, uh, the one year anniversary of the insurrection at our nation's capital. That insurrection continues this day to this day under the banner of the big lie. 
lie that our election was somehow not fair in the last election. The right to representative government today is under attack in this country. And unfortunately, I must say also in our own state. I'm pro-democracy. And I think all elected officials and others who care about our state and nation should be pro-democracy too. Former Secretary of State Kim Wyman, Republican, deserves our respect for the exemplary and nonpartisan way she carried out her duties in the face of these same threats. And that's why I'm happy to welcome former Senator Steve Hobbs as our new Secretary of State. Like Kim Wyman, he will help keep our state and local elections safe and secure. It is time that we stand up to those who challenge the integrity of our elections, who undermine the basic democratic principles, and who would do away with the rule of law. And I am calling on all legislators, Democrat and Republican, to acknowledge forcefully and vocally that the 2020 elections were won fair and square under our Constitution, and to denounce those officials who spread deception that strikes at the very foundation of our democracy. So I believe we should outlaw efforts by politicians to knowingly spread lies about elections when those lies result in violence. Violence we have already seen in our state capitals, or our state capital, and a year ago in our nation's capital. As we close today, I want to reiterate that this may be a short session, but it is unlike any perhaps in our state's history. And we must act according to what this moment demands. We must be big. We must be bold. We must act at a scale commensurate to our challenges because of the multiple urgent crises facing our state. Too much is at stake to do otherwise. And I am confident we can do this because I have seen the legislature rise to the moment before. But we must take action this day. We will continue to build our resiliency against COVID. We will meet the challenge of climate change while building the clean energy future with good jobs here in Washington. We will restore our children's opportunities. We will make necessary revisions to our long-term care bill and our police accountability measures. We will protect salmon and bring back our orca. And we will house those impacted by homelessness and behavioral health conditions and provide more housing, affordable housing options for everyone. This is our charge. We can do this if we act together. There is no time to lose. We can start now by taking action this day. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Inslee, so very much. With the consent of the body, the joint session is now dissolved. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Hi, I'm Chris Gildon, State Senator for the 25th Legislative District, Senator in Puyallup. You've just heard remarks from the governor and I'd like to take just a few moments to go over another perspective regarding the state of our state. Washington is certainly a diverse one. From the fertile farmlands to the coast, from the Columbia to the Cascades, we have people of all backgrounds just trying to live their lives, raise their families, and earn a living as best as they can. The legislature reflects that diversity. Our opinions are shaped by our unique stories and our experiences. But one thing that we should all recognize legislators and all elected officials, is that we work for you. We exist to represent your needs, your interests, and your priorities. It's been almost two years since our system of government has been turned upside down when implementation of the emergency order muted the voice of the people. While I think we can all agree that the executive branch must have a certain amount of latitude to act in desperate times, I also believe that it's well past time to move away from emergency rule. We need to return to the rule of law, where each of our three branches of government 
fulfill their constitutional mandate to serve as a check and a balance on the other so that no branch has an exceeding amount of power over the other. After almost 700 days of emergency rule, it's apparent that many people across our state feel that our system of government has betrayed them, that their voices no longer matter. They have simply given up hope. Legislators this session must right the ship. We must restore balance to state government and elevate the voice of the people. We do this by setting reasonable limits on the use of emergency powers by the executive branch. We do this by ensuring the legislative branch exerts its power as a co-equal branch of government. And we do this in a manner that's acceptable to both Republicans and to Democrats. House and Senate Republicans have been listening to you in other areas of governance as well. We've heard your cries for justice as crime hit 25 year highs just after recent laws took effect that hamper the ability of men and women in uniform to properly enforce our laws. We believe that a society that does not enforce its laws and protect its citizens is a society destined for disaster. And we are on the cliff of that disaster. And now is the time to bring our society back from a state of lawlessness and into alignment with true principles of justice. We must fix parts of the police reform bills that were passed last year so that law enforcement can once again enforce the law in a responsible manner. We must allow them to serve as that vital link in connecting a person experiencing mental distress with a mental health provider. We must stop efforts to legalize hard drugs. Drug overdoses have increased 50% in the last five years. Fentanyl is killing our loved ones, and I'm sure many of you know someone who's been affected by the plague of addiction that is gripping our state. And I'll tell you, the most compassionate thing we can do right now is to stop allowing those in need to continue suffering on our city streets. We have to offer them the treatment and the rehabilitation that they so desperately need. We've heard you loud and clear regarding the ever-increasing cost of living, due in part to the flood of new and higher taxes that the majority has passed in recent years. Did you know that they've implemented 22 new taxes over the last three sessions alone? Did you also know that the transportation plan proposed by the majority last year included 32 new and higher taxes? We know many of you oppose a state budget where spending is up 90% over the last decade, especially when we have so little to show for it. We've poured hundreds of millions of your tax dollars into addressing homelessness, but the problem only gets worse. The governor himself says that government restrictions prevent us from building more housing. A critical solution is to remove these barriers to eliminate the unnecessary and costly regulations. We must stop piling on taxes and regulations that are cho choking the housing supply and making home prices and rents in Washington just unbearable. How is anyone supposed to buy their first home in this environment? State government hasn't provided the solution because it's been part of the problem. This is also true of the ill-conceived long-term care payroll tax that's been just wildly unpopular across the political spectrum. More than 400,000 of you have already filed for an exemption, and that number will only grow. We all see inflation getting worse. We feel your pain each time that tank of gas you need to get you through the week takes a bigger bite out of your family budget. And we hear your desperation over the growing cost of feeding that family. Supply chain problems contribute to this, but so do regulations that make growing and processing our food harder and more expensive for our farmers, our orchardists, and our ranchers. Regardless of all this, our state budget is particularly robust. As a matter of fact, estimates show we'll have approximately $10 billion more than previously expected over the four-year budget cycle. We believe the state should not collect more in taxes than is absolutely necessary 
to properly perform the functions of government. The last thing you need as you recover from the pandemic is for government to take more money away from you. In fact, we believe you should be given some of your money back in the form of tax relief, specifically in four areas. First, we should exempt the first $250,000 in value of a primary residence from property taxes. This benefits all Washingtonians, owners and renters alike. Second, eliminate the business and occupation tax on manufacturing. This specific sector has lost over 70,000 jobs since the start of the 21st century. We should create conditions that will bring those high paying family wage jobs back to Washington. Third, eliminate the capital gains income tax. Given our budgetary surplus, not only is this tax unnecessary, but you the people have rejected an income tax 11 times. Why won't the majority accept your will? Finally, we should eliminate the long-term care payroll tax. The program's unworkable, financially unsound, and voters across the state have rejected measures related to the tax twice already. Today, I'll leave you with this final thought. House and Senate Republicans are working to restore public safety, make life more affordable, and to rebuild your trust in state government. We believe these are principles all Washingtonians can embrace. And that is so important because our society has been fractured over recent years. There are those who seek to divide us along any of our discernible differences. We believe the time for divisionary politics is over. It's now time for all Washingtonians to come together in common purpose around the policies that unite us. It's time for us to embrace the fact that we can join together for a common purpose. We can improve our beautiful state. And we invite you to join us in efforts to reduce crime, lower the cost of living, honor the will and the voice of voters, and bring political healing and unity to our state. We also invite you to contact us via phone and email because we listen to the people and we work for all of Washington. Thank you so much for listening. It's an honor to serve this great state and may God bless you all.